Hope you guys are doing well today. David has not been sleeping good the last couple of nights, and so I am over-caffeinated and um, <laughs> underslept, I guess. So uh, maybe some of you are here thinking, yeah, me too. I get that. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get moving here in Acts. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that uh, you are here with us today. We're thankful that it is really you that we've come to hear. We've come to hear your words. We've come to hear what you have to say. And I don't think anybody here is on accident, Lord. I believe you have every single person here for a reason to hear what you have to say to them. And so I pray that as we are here that we put our skeptical self aside and that we are open to what your word says. And Father, I do pray that you're the one that speaks, that you get me out of the way. And we just look at what your word has to say. Because it is your word that changes lives. And it is the Holy Spirit inside of us that enacts that change. And so I am here today, God, just asking that you show up in a mighty way. That you speak and that people are ready to hear what you have to say. And that our hearts are ready and that we are ready to not only hear what you have to say, but to apply it. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a saying that you guys have probably heard a million times. Everyone is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. How many of you have heard this, right? It's on Facebook, any kind of social media. You see this kind of stuff all the time, right? But it is true. It is true. Everybody that you run into, they have their own fights. They have their own battles that they are going through. And it's funny, right? Because when we come to church, all of a sudden we act like we're the only ones without them. Because we think some, for some reason, when we come into church, that we have to be battle free, we have to be ready, and we have to be perfect, and we have to be, uh, we have to be good enough to be at church, which is ironic, isn't it? But, to feel like we, but we do feel that way sometimes. But each and every one of us, we have these battles that we are fighting. Some of you have babies and toddlers at home, and like me, you're tired right? Because you have these massive swings where sometimes your toddlers will do something and you're like, they're a genius. And other times they do something and they're like, have I taught them anything ever? Like, why would you do that? Why did you put mac and cheese in your sister's shoes? Like, why? What what was the thought? Don't even tell me what the thought process was. But if you have kids or you have toddlers, that's actually a true story. If you have kids and you have toddlers, you know it is. It's true. He really did that. Uh, you know that's real. That's real life, right? And so some of you, are you're a mom and you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a dad and you're a, you come home and you are there with your kids and it's tough. It's a fight. It's a battle. You're trying to train them in the right way. You're trying to do it in the way that honors God. And you're also trying to do it in the way where you and they survive. And then some of you have younger kids. You're out of the toddler phase, but you're trying to teach them to be kids. And they do stuff like tell you to stop at stop signs that you may or may not have rolled through. Like they do stuff like that. Also a true story. And you know, you're trying to work with them and you're trying to teach them and they're trying to learn. And they're at an age when they think they should be teaching you. And so your six and seven and eight and nine year olds are telling you what to do. And you're like, I got this, right? But in part of you is like, well, do I have this? You know? And so you're trying, you're fighting these battles with your kids. Some of you have teenagers. And when you figure it out, let me know, because my kids will be there soon enough. But man, raising teenagers in this world, what a crazy thing. What a crazy thing. And so you're trying to raise teenagers and young adults in a world that is so different than when you grew up. Because there's cell phones that are ruining lives, and social media is ruining lives, and everything's a big deal, and everything's chaos, and it's very emotional, right? And so you're trying to help them through this time, and uh, yeah, you're just trying to keep them alive still, because they're teenagers, and you have to let them know, it's okay, you're going to survive this, I promise. And you are in the back of your mind are going, but are we going to survive this? right? Because you have teenagers and young adults. Some of you are in a spot where you just watch your kids graduate. They're leaving the nest now. And so you're like, do I even like my spouse? You're like trying to figure out all this stuff. You're trying to figure out how do I, how do I act as a parent and love them and treat them right and also allow them to kind of learn the hard things. When do I step in? When do I step out? And that's a hard struggle, right? And some of you are those kids or teenagers or young adults and you're trying to figure out who you are and you're going through this life and it's new for you and it's chaotic for you and you're trying to figure it out and the world's telling you one thing and church is telling you another thing and your parents are telling you something and you're like, could everybody just stop telling me something for a minute because I don't know what's happening 
to me, right? We all go through these different stages. We have these different fights. Some of you are fighting loss, and you've had a significant loss. And with the holidays coming up, it's even more difficult because it's just a reminder that now there's an empty seat where once there was a loved one, and that's a hard thing to be working through. And some of you, you have that poor health. And so you're walking that road, and you're wondering, God, what's going on? Where are you taking me in all of this? And then some of you are watching others go through this, and they're in poor health, and you're watching it, and that's hard too, especially when it's somebody you love, and you can't fix it, and it's not you, and it's hard. And so we all have these fights. We all have these battles that we're walking through. And so how do we handle them? How do we find peace? That's our sermon today, finding your peace. How do we find peace when the world's in chaos? Because the world itself is in chaos. But even when we try to retreat from that and we don't watch the news and we retreat to our own lives, we find that there's a lot of chaos right there in our own sweet little lives, right? And so how do we find peace in this this chaotic world? That's what we're going to be looking at today. One of the ways that we often try to find peace, which is not the right way, is we're going to find, we try to take control of the situation. Anybody like a control freak? Like that's how you're willing to admit it. A couple of you, the rest of you aren't willing to admit it, and that's fine. I saw your spouse raise their hand for you, and that's nice. You know, I'm sure you'll be sleeping on the couch, but it's okay. And I, but some of you, you are, you're a control freak. You want that control because having that control makes you feel more at peace. At least you feel like it makes you feel more at peace. But you're trying so hard to get control that you're lacking peace. If that's you, you're like, yep, that's me. I do that over and over and over again, right? And we get through this cycle. But it's, it's common. And that's where we are today. We're actually going to look at two different sides of the coin here of finding peace. One is a, the wrong way to go about it. And then the other one is the correct way. The wrong way to go about it actually starts here. Acts 12, 1 through 5. We're going to be looking at Herod. It says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Remember, if you've been tracking with me, Peter at this time is the most important person in Christianity. He really is. Jesus has ascended, and Peter is the de facto leader. And so everybody is looking at Peter. So Peter now, he is arrested. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So we have to start with this guy, Herod the king. Because if you are familiar with the New Testament at all, you'll see the word Herod pop up over and over again. And it's not always talking about the same guy. But Herod here, this is Herod Agrippa I. And to understand his mentality and his mindset, we have to kind of go back. And his grandfather, his grandfather is Herod the king. uh, Herod the Great, excuse me. Herod the Great. That might sound familiar, maybe it doesn't. But Herod the Great is the one that tried to kill Jesus. He is the one that the wise men came to and said, we are here to see the king of the Jews. And he was like, no, you're not, because the king of the Jews is me. That's what they called him. He was called the king of the Jews. And so he got mad, and he said to them, when you find him, come tell me, so I may kill, I mean, worship him. That was weird. How did that slip out? right? That's how he, that's how it was. And so this is how he reacted to Jesus being born because the wise men, they were warned not to go back to Herod. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. What is Herod trying to do? He is the king of the Jews and they say there is a king of the Jews. What is he trying to hold on to? His kingdom, his power. He's like, no, I'm not giving this up. I like this job. It fits me very well. And he's like, I'm not giving this up. So he's trying to hold on to it. It gets worse for him. He always feared potential rivals. He had his wife's brother, that guy, the high priest, drowned in the swimming pool in his palace. He put to death 46 members of the Sanhedrin. He was Jewish on his mother's side. He's Jewish. But he was worried about how the Jews were perceiving him. And so he had 46 members of the Sanhedrin killed. He killed his own mother-in-law. Leave that one alone. 
He also had his wife murdered along with two of their sons as he considered them potential rivals with legitimate claim to the throne because of their lineage. Herod had 10 wives in all and many other children who did not have Hasmonean blood. Augustus Caesar, he's the emperor over all of the land. So Augustus Caesar is above Herod. Herod is reigning in because Caesar has allowed him that privilege. He is reported to have said, it is better to be Herod's dog than one of his children. Nice guy. Perfect for a, few, for a, a tombstone, right? <laughs> Not exactly. That's who his grandfather is. That's who his grandfather is. Who was his father? We don't get to know because his grandfather killed him. <laughs> he, he was three years old. This is Herod Agrippa's the father, okay? He was three years old when his mother was killed by Herod the Great. And then his father was killed also by his grandfather for the same reason. He was trying to hold on to this power. And so now you have this Herod, Herod Agrippa I. He is the one that is reigning. And so he is trying to hold on to his power. But it's a weird thing, because as I said, the, the emperor, he is the one that has given power to Herod. So Herod is ruling over a small section. It's kind of like being a governor, okay? Think about it that way. Herod is the president, and then, uh, I mean, excuse me, Augustus is the president, and Herod is uh, the governor. Think of it that way. And so it's really important for him to stay in good graces with the people in Rome because they're the ones in actual power. But there's a problem. Despite being raised and educated in Rome, Agrippa was always on shaky ground with the Romans. Not good, because they're in charge of him. He ran up numerous debts in Rome and then fled to Palestine, leaving angry creditors behind him. Unwise comments he made got back to the Roman emperor Tiberius who promptly imprisoned him. Released from prison following Tiberius' death, he was made rule, ruler of northern Palestine, to which Judah and Samaria were eventually added in AD 41. He ruled the largest territory of Palestine since his grandfather, Herod the Great, nearly 50 years earlier. Because of his bad relationship, his tenuous relationship with Rome, it was important and imperative that he maintain the loyalty of his Jewish subjects. So he is trying to maintain his power because Rome and him are at odds. And so to keep his power, he has to keep his providence under control because they're looking for a reason to get rid of him. And he's trying to make sure he doesn't give them a reason to get rid of him. And the way he does this is he starts to attack the Jews' enemies, the Christians. That's where we are in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. That's what he's doing. He's attacking them. And when he recognized how much killing James, the brother of John, one of the 12 disciples, pleased the Jews, he decides he's going to go after the biggest fish of them all. He's going to go get Peter. And so this is, how, this is one way we try to rule. We try to reign and we try to take control of situations ourselves. We try to keep any way that we can keep ourselves in charge. That's what Herod does, and that's what we do sometimes when we are in these difficult circumstances. But look where this gets him. Acts 12, 20 through 24. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of man. What was he really excited about? He's been trying to hold all this power, and now they're calling him a God, not a man. And he's dressed in the finest of robes. He does have a, quite a bit of power. He's ruling over a massive amount of land. And now he's like, I just gave this great speech. You know what? I am. I'm like a god. That's how he felt. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And so just so you know what that idea of being eaten by worms is, right? So the guy who wrote this, the person who wrote this is Luke. He's a doctor. He wrote both Luke and Acts, okay? And so Dr. Luke, that's who he's talking about, the writer here, he saw Herod's intestinal attack 
That's what happened. When it says he fell over, he literally, like, he's talking. They call him a god. He's like, yes, I am. And all of a sudden, he gets this massive stomach ache. And he's like, oh, in front of everybody, and he's got to leave. That's what's going on here. And gave a more medical explanation of his death than Josephus. Josephus is a historian during that day. Josephus doesn't write anything that is in the Bible, but he writes a lot of, he was a Jewish historian. So he kept track of a lot of things that were going on during that time. You'll hear Josephus referenced a lot. And so he gave more uh, information than even Josephus did. One writer suggested that Herod suffered from appendicitis that led to parentitis complicated by roundworms. Another diagnosed him as having a cyst caused by a tapeworm. More important than the effect it was the cause, namely Herod's pride. So he sees himself as this big bad God ruling over. And while he's given this and while he's feeling awesome, he falls over. He has to leave. And he's like, thank you so much. He goes to his room, suffers for five days, and dies. Not so great on the whole God thing, right? Didn't work out so well for him. And so what can we take from him? When we try to take control of everything in our lives, the situation in our lives, and we find ourselves fighting to stay in control of this, and we're reluctant to give things over to God, it's painful, isn't it? Think about how much work he was going through and his grandfather went through to keep himself in control. That has to be exhausting. He's killing his wife, and he's killing, he's killing his mother-in-law. He's killing his own, all of his own people. He killed his own son to stay in power. He had babies killed. How, what? What happens? What happens is when we as humans see our control slipping out of our fingers, oftentimes we'll do anything we can to get it back because we want to be in control. And we're so reluctant to give it up and give it over to God. And so... Would this define you right now? Have you been fighting to stay in control of your own life? Have you been fighting tooth and nail to stay in charge? When you look at your own life and you know that God has directed you certain ways and he's called you certain directions, are you fighting this? You, many of you, you've been going to church. Some of you longer than I've been alive. So you know God's word. But what are we doing with that? Are we fighting against it or are we accepting it? Because it's really easy to try so hard to stay in control. But when we find ourselves fighting to stay in control, what we find is we'll find ourselves tired, we'll find ourselves exhausted, and honestly, we'll find ourselves unhappy and in pain. Because we're fighting against something so much bigger than us. And we're elevating ourselves to a position you were never meant to be in. So many of you today are lacking peace because you think you're big enough to handle it. And I know that's hard to say in Wyoming County, isn't it? Because there are some massive guys around here. People that look like they can just pick up these cows they're working with and chuck them, right? Like, this is amazing. There's hard workers in this area. And so this idea of surrendering over to God is even more difficult, I think, for us and people here that are blue-collar workers that are so used to having a problem and fixing it. It's hard, right? Because you're like, yeah, I can handle this, whatever it is. Milk prices are down, I'll handle this. Whatever it might be, right? And so many of us are so used to doing that, that when it comes time to go, I'm not big enough to handle my own life. Doesn't this sound terrible? Also being patriotic, it doesn't sound American either. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It doesn't sound like the American dream. And so, so much of us, uh, our desire to be autonomous, rule ourselves. Everything inside of us is telling us, no, I can handle this. I'll take it. I'll do it. And what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up and we're seeing ourselves as bigger than we are. So when our circumstances are bigger than we are, we find ourselves crushed because all of a sudden we can't handle it. And so that's where many people are today. So where are we supposed to be? Where are we supposed to be? Oh yeah, I love this. Uh, I love how they put this because you know, don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor, right? Because this guy thinks he's a God. And by, by verse 24, it goes, yeah, he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Isn't that funny? It is to me. You guys are like, no, you have a bad sense of humor. That's fair. But it's funny to me because it's so obvious of what actually happens in our lives. We struggle and struggle and struggle to stay in control. And the whole while, God's like, yeah, still God. N never stop being God. I'm still in control. <laughs> you know, I need to calm down a little bit. It's just, I love how they put it right after that. 
He tried to hold his glory. He struck down, eaten by worms, but the word of God increased and multiplied. So now we move over to the church because the church handles a situation that they're in phenomenally. So what's going on in the church since we started Acts is there's persecution everywhere. It started off in Acts chapter 4. They were persecuted by the priests, the captain of the temple. The captain of the temple was kind of like a chief of police. The temple had a lot of different uh, stations. And inside those stations, there was one guy that ruled over all of the different stations inside the temple to keep order in this temple. And so the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, they are persecuting the church in Acts 4. By the time we get to Acts 7 and Acts 8, it's the Sanhedrin, which is all of the rulers from the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the two different leading sects of Judaism. And so the Sadducees and the uh, Pharisees, they are now together, and they are persecuting the Christians. And so by the time you get to Acts 12, not only do you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you also have the government. And all three of these are coming together to work against Christians. And so by this time, anywhere inside this Jewish area, Christians face persecution from all fronts. There was nowhere inside this area where Christians were safe anymore. Now it was from every single angle. And so how are they going to handle this? How are they going to handle this? The first way that they handle this is through prayer. It's through prayer. So what did they do? Peter, he was taken, he was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And I, being a pastor, like I, usually, I try to put myself in your head. So if I was you and I was sitting there and you were me and you were telling me to pray for my problems, my first thought would be, I hate you, I already have, right? Because many of you are thinking that, you're like, pray, yeah, done that, done it a lot. It doesn't seem to be changing the circumstances that I am in. We're going to get that, to that in a second because I understand that. I've been there. I've prayed for circumstances to change and not watch the circumstances change at all. But something else changed. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound good? Isn't that what everybody wants? Like seriously, if, if we could pick one thing to be true, in the scriptures it might be this. If this was always true in our life, if you were always at peace, and a peace that is not just regular, but it surpasses understanding, means outside of whatever circumstances you're in, it doesn't matter. You still have this fulfilled peace that is given to you by God. Wouldn't that be amazing? And so some of you are like, well, why does it happen? Why is it that I have prayed and, and I don't have this? What's going on here? I'll look at a couple of different things. First thing I want to talk about is how are you praying? And I also need to preface this. I am not saying to pray harder for your prayers, okay? I'm not saying the reason you're in your circumstances and they haven't changed is because you're not praying hard enough. Do not hear that. I just want you to see what is happening with their prayers, okay? So the adverb, ekestenos, I can't say that very well. Fervently is related to ectones, a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Ectones is used in Luke 22, 44 to describe our Lord's prayer in Gethsemane. When it said, being in agony, he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. The church poured the maximum effort they were capable of into their prayers for Peter. That's how they're praying. That's how they were praying. They knew the situation Peter was in, and that's, how, that's what they did. They took everything, and they gave it all over to God. And the idea of that stretching of the muscle. A lot of people, when they're first learning to pray, they're like, what do I say? Or if you haven't prayed in a long time. Or if, quite frankly, you're dealing with sin in your life, and you're trying to pray, and you're like, I feel disconnected. Prayer is a lot like this. It's something that continues to grow. Just like your relationship with a person, your relationship with God continues to grow as you stretch those muscles. So what, it st sometimes when you start to pray, you're like, I don't feel like I'm getting much out of this. And I understand that. I understand that. It's hard. The first time you meet somebody and you have a conversation, you're also not hopping right into your deepest, darkest secrets, right? I hope not. Please don't. <laughs> You'll scare people. You, know, you, you work your way into that relationship. The same thing happens with God oftentimes, is it feels weird if you haven't done it before. 
And then the more and more you do it, the more and more natural it becomes. So this is how they are praying. What are you praying? I, this, this for me is prayer summed up. Okay, this is to me is when I was going through this in Matthew, when we were uh, teaching through Matthew, this really changed so much about how I saw prayer. This prayer right here, when they asked him, how should we pray, Lord? And you, many of you will know this. He said, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He starts off that prayer with our Father. What does that do? That sets our mind right. That means I know who I'm coming to. If I'm approaching God, if I'm approaching him, I'm approaching him as a father. As a father myself, when my kids approach me, it's much different than when somebody else approaches you, right? It's, it's so much different. They know who I am. They know that we have this history. We have this background. We have this familiarity. And also on top of that, they know that they have my unconditional love. And so you are coming to God. And so it sets our mind right that I am coming to God as my father, which is very important to us. In heaven, what does that do for me? When I pray our father, I know who he is. I know he's relational. When I pray in heaven, I know he's bigger than me. And so sometimes when we talk into God, especially if you prayed for something and it hasn't come the way you wanted, in our minds we start to limit what God is capable of. We would never say it out loud. We would never say it out loud. But in our minds, we all have done that, right? We start, our prayers start getting a little bit less big. And so you start off asking for something big, and by the end you're like, please don't let me die today. Amen. Right? You work your way down because your expectations are lower. But so our Father, relational, in heaven, he's bigger than me. It sets us up for what we're going to talk to him about. Hallowed be thy name. This reminds me of who I'm talking to. Because he's my father. He is in heaven. He's bigger than me. But he's also deserving of glory. He's deserving of praise. So in your circumstances, when circumstances are bad, it is not typical to desire praise, is it? It's not normal. And so what does prayer do? Prayer puts us back in our proper place. Prayer reminds us that there are angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And the circumstances of life do not change the fact that those angels are saying that. And so he's deserving of our praise. Your kingdom come. I love this because this is a reminder that whatever circumstance you're in has an end date. Has an end date has an expiration. Some of your circumstances, unfortunately, their expiration is your expiration, right? You're going to carry them with you. A lot of people have scars that they will carry with them all of their life, and that we slowly, we give them over to God, and he begins to heal us, but we carry those scars with us. But one day, his kingdom will come, and the circumstance that you're dealing with will expire. So our Father, he's relational. In heaven, he's bigger than us. Hallowed be your name. He's deserving of my praise despite of my circumstances. Your kingdom come means my circumstances will one day end. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It reminds us of who's in control. It reminds me of who's in control. Because we want control. We're fighting for control. And this puts us back in our place. If his will is done in the heavens, you think mankind has anything to do to stand against his will? It's not possible. So it puts us in the right place. Give us this day our daily bread. So after all of this, we ask Jesus for enough to sustain us today. See, a lot of times the things you're praying for in the circumstances, you're asking for something to completely end, to completely cease. And you forget that the things that you're going through, as hard as they are, they're not wasted. It's not a surprise to God. Many of these things, as we talked about two weeks ago, they're part of this plan that God has where he's either changing you or he's changing the things around you. And so give us this day our daily bread reminds me that I don't need my circumstance to completely end as much as I'd like that. But whatever God is doing in my life, in the midst of these hard circumstances, I need that and I need it today. That changes our perspective. That changes us from going to God and saying, God, take this away. 
from us going to, God, you're my father, you care about me. You're in heaven, you're bigger than me. Hallowed be your name, despite of my circumstances, you are still you and I am still me. Your kingdom come, one day you will rule and my circumstances will end. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have the power to change it, so if you haven't, you have me here for a reason. So, because you have me here for a reason today, give me what I need for today to work out what you are working out in my life. That's a completely different kind of prayer, isn't it? That's not how we usually pray. Who is praying? James 5, 16. Inside of this Acts uh, 12, it's, the whole, it's that church. It's that church family. They're all praying together. And so one of the things I would say is if you are in a circumstance that you are walking through that is very difficult, it's very hard, don't be the only one praying about it. Find some people you trust and ask them to pray with you. Ask them to keep up with it. Therefore, James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I have things in my life when I have need prayer, I have certain people that I go to that I ask for, that I know they're going to pray. There's some people that will tell you I'm praying and they're not. And then there's some people that tell you they're praying and they are. Find out who is in that second group. Have a couple of them. And when you need prayer, go to them. How to find our peace. The second thing is we have to trust and allow God to be in control. This is, this is so cool. Uh, this is a verse so many people know, and it's very hard to live out, isn't it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. It sounds so simple. It sounds so simple. So now, let's go to Peter. What is Peter doing? What does his circumstances look like? What his circumstances look like are one of his best friends just had his head cut off. That same guy who cut his head off has taken him, put him in prison. What is Peter doing in prison? He has four squads of four. What they would do with these soldiers is you as a prisoner would be inside of the cell and you would be chained to two different uh, soldiers. So he's in prison cell, chained to two soldiers. The other two soldiers would be right outside of the cell, and they are guarding the cell door. And those four squads of four just mean that they would rotate. They would rotate turns, okay? Because they're not guarding you 24, they are guarding you 24 seven, and they're doing that through four different squads of four. That's what's going on here. And so this is Peter. This is where he's at. And uh, the next day, we're at verse four, and when he had seized him, Put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of four to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. And so if you are Peter, how are you feeling? Yeah, scared, desperate. Yeah, all those things, right? And don't over-spiritualize it, right? Because think about the circumstances we have in our own lives and how they stack up to the circumstances that Peter's in. And so just magnify however you feel about your circumstance right now. Right? Isn't that fair? That's how you'd feel. That's how we are. We'd feel overburdened. We'd feel anxious. We'd feel scared. We'd feel terrified. We would not know what to do with ourselves. Many of us would probably be trying to make right with God, right? Many of us would be going through all these things in our mind and going, okay, uh, I got some things I got to talk to God about and trying to go through all of this. That's what we'd be doing. We'd be trying to figure out, okay, what's next? Where am I? Because I'm in these crazy circumstances. And since I'm in all of these circumstances, how am I going to make it out of them? And then it gets worse. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, on that very night, and so it's the day before his execution. So if you are the day before your execution, All those feelings we have are just absolutely magnified, aren't they? We're worried about our circumstances. And I already gave it away if you read faster than I do. What is Peter doing? He's sleeping. Isn't that funny? I'm telling you, you guys are not laughing. That's hilarious. Because the circumstances that he's in are not sleepable times. They are like mash, figure out something, Hogan's heroes, how am I getting out of here, right? They are desperate situations. We need to be planning. We need to figure something out. All right, when they let me go, I'm going to run. He's Peter. He's probably pretty strong. I can grab one guy and I can hit him with that. Like, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to think, how am I getting out of this situation? Not Peter. He's like, all right, see you guys tomorrow. (laughs) Even if you're the soldiers, aren't you like, what's wrong with this guy? Like, 
Maybe he needs to die. He might not be safe for society. He'd be worried about him. He'd be crazy. Because we read these stories and we know the end of them. So we never put ourselves in this situation. Because if I'm Peter, I ain't sleeping. I'm definitely not sleeping. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm making things right. I'm talking to God. I'm trying to figure some things out. I'm trying to get out of this. Not Peter. He's sleeping. That's crazy. That's the kind of trust that we should hope to have. And so with all the circumstances that he's in, how is it that Peter's able to have this trust? Because it's one thing to say trust. It's another thing to live it. The first thing he does is he has to remember his past. This isn't Peter's first rodeo. He's been in prison before, two other times, actually. In Acts 4, he was put into prison. And then also in Acts 5, he was put into prison. And in Acts 5, look at this. They arrested the apostles and they put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And if you remember, they took him and he had him speaking in the temple. So the guys came to execute him or to at least discipline him. And they're like, where are they? And everybody's like, I'm pretty sure they're speaking at the temple. And they're like, what? <laughs> well, go send for them. Who? Not me, you. Like, I'm not going after that guy. You go get him. And so they send somebody to go get him. So Peter, he's been here before. So one of the things we have to do when it comes to finding peace is we have to go back and we have to look at the times that God proved himself in our own lives. Those times that we took that little step of faith and God rewarded that step of faith and he brought us through it. We look back to the difficult times we've had before and how God has walked us through those. And if he's walked us through those, he can walk us through this. So part of the reason Peter is so okay is because he's like, been here before. <laughs> he's like, might as well sleep on this guy. He's a little bit more comfy. Like last time, I didn't have anybody to lay in on, right? And so this is where Peter's at. He's remembering these things of where he has been. The second thing we have to be able to do is we have to be able to treat the highs and the lows the same. We have to be able to treat the highs and the lows of life the same. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you have Herod, and Herod is at a high, right? He's a ruler. He's a king. He has everything at his disposal. He can have whatever he wants. And did he seem to live with peace? He had no peace. Isn't that weird? So many of us think if my circumstances were changed, I'd have peace. I'd argue with you. I'd argue with you. You know why? Because I see lots of really famous people, lots of really rich people. I see people in Hollywood. I see people in politics. Well-known, power, prestige, fame, money, cars, whatever they want. They have all of that. No peace. No peace at all. I would argue about the circumstances. I, don't, I think they could help. I'm not saying that. But just because the circumstances are good doesn't mean you're at peace if you're always fighting for that control. And so what I mean by treating the highs and the lows the same is how can it be that Herod has no peace and Peter, he's about to have his head cut off by a guy who's already cut off one of his best friend's heads and he's stuck and chained to two different uh, guards, two different guards out in front of that door and he's supposed to die tomorrow and he's fast asleep. What a contrast Acts 12 gives us. Life without faith in God and life with faith in God. You can have everything and be missing that trust of knowing who God is and knowing that he's in control. And you can be without peace. And you can have nothing in bad circumstances of life and know who's in control and say, I trust him. I'm going to trust him here. What a contrast. Where do you find yourself? Treat the highs and the lows the same. I love this quote. This is from Charles Spurgeon, so obviously it's amazing. Oh, Lord, my God. This is from, he's quoting, this is part of a commentary from Act, uh, Psalm 7. Oh, Lord, my God, mine is a special covenant sealed by Jesus' blood and ratified in my own soul by a sense of union to you. In you and you only do I put my trust. Even now in my sore distress, listen to this, I shake, but my rock move not. It is never right to distrust God and never vain to trust him. Man, he words that well, doesn't he? Could have just read that and said, go home. That's, this is where we should be. It's hard to get there, but that's where we're supposed to be. I shake, but my rock moves not. It is never right to distrust God and never vain to trust him. All right, I saved this one for last. Uh, not last, but towards the end. We have to be able to trust his word. So why actually is Peter okay? 
Because those circumstances are wild, right? And so the things I've said definitely play into it. But why is Peter okay? Because Peter knows already what happened with James and what ha- is to happen with him. Because it was already prophesied by Jesus what was going to happen to James and what was going to happen to him. In Matthew 20, 22 through 23, remember uh, his mother, James and John's mother comes up and says to Jesus, hey, when your kingdom comes, let my boy sit at your left hand and your right hand which she didn't know, but she was saying, move God the Father over and stick my son there, and then put another son next to Jesus on the other side. And this is Jesus' answer to her. What do you want? She said, uh, verse 22, Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. And then he says, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. And so the cup he's talking about is that Jesus knows he's about to go and give his life. And he just told James, you're going to do the same. So Peter already knew this was going to happen to James. Now you're thinking, I don't want to be James, because that doesn't sound fun, right? So Peter already knew this. So that wasn't a surprise to him. So why is he feeling okay about himself? Because Jesus also talked to him about his future. John 21, 18 through 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter had already worked out how he's going to die. And so Peter is sitting there with somebody who God has already said he's going to die. And it came true. So his best, one of his best friends, head cut off. He's in prison, supposed to die tomorrow. And he is sitting in the prison asleep because he has already been told by God, you're set until you're old. Now, it's easy to overlook this and go, well, that's not fair, Ben, because Jesus told him that. So he knew what his circumstances were. I don't know what my circumstances look like. Yeah, but where's Jesus right now? Where's Jesus right now during this? He's in heaven. He's not there for him to be like, still good, and him to go, right? He's not there. So what does he have to do right now? He has to trust. He has to trust that what God has once said is still true. Well, that sounds familiar. That's where we all are. Peter's in the exact same position, a little worse, that many of us find ourselves in. We're in a position of, Even though my circumstances look bad, do I believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he's going to do? You're in the same position as Peter. And so it's easy to look at Peter and go, oh, that's not fair. But it's actually the same. We're in the same circumstances. Because Jesus has already spoken to us about our lives. Romans 8, 28 we know that all of these that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Do I believe him? When I sit down at night, do I find myself sleeping or do I find myself tormented going through my own mind of how can I get myself back in control? When I have these circumstances of life, which we are either all in or about to be in, because that's how life is, isn't it? You're either in the midst of a fight or you're about to come into a fight. It's just how it goes. It's life. And when I'm in those, what am I doing? Am I grasping for control or am I stepping back? Am I going through in prayer? Am I having others pray? Am I trusting in who God says he is? Am I trusting in the promises that he's already said? Where am I with this? Because we're in the same position that Peter is. And Peter is okay. He's at peace. He's going to sleep. Herod is in control, has everything, and is fighting for peace. That's the difference. We are either at peace because we are giving it to God, or we are at war in ourselves. And so many of you are at war in yourselves. And you haven't had peace in forever. And you've been trying to fix it. Maybe your circumstances haven't changed because God is using them to bring you where you need to be. And so it's not, God, get me out of here. It's God, give me today my daily bread. 
Give me today exactly what you meant for today to give me. I'm in these circumstances. It's not surprising to you. And so if I'm here and you've allowed it, allow it to work in me what you want it to work out. And then as we walk through life, it's not easy, but it's definitely easier. Because I remember that God's my father, so he knows me and he cares me for me and he sees me. I know he's in heaven. I know he's bigger than I am. I know his will is done in heaven, and so his will will be done on earth. And so if I'm here in these circumstances, I can rest like Peter because he is using it to do something. What? I don't know. I really don't. Trust me, I've had my own situations in this where I am preaching to the choir, okay? Where it's like, God, I don't get this one. This doesn't make any sense. I don't see it. But I believe he does. And I've seen him bring me through things that I've been in before. And I've seen his faithfulness then, so I can trust his faithfulness now. This is the last one. It might not be the obvious answer, right? Because when we're in these situations, we always think, God, if you would just X, Y, Z, we'd be out of this circumstance, right? We always think it through in our head. And we're like, this is the answer. This is obvious. If you would just this, then I'd be fine. It's not always the obvious answer, though, because it certainly wasn't in this, is it? This is what happens. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him. One of the things I was reading, by the way, said, how at peace was Peter? So much so that the angel had to nudge him and wake him up. Peter, wake up. <laughs> and he's on the side, and he woke him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense. A lot of times the situation that we see, the solution that we see, we're like, God, this is obvious. Do this. And so when that's not happening, we're like, he must not have heard me. It's not always the way it seems. It's not always the easy way. It's not always the, the most obvious answer, how he gets us out of it, or how he brings us through it, or how he gives us our daily bread for that day that we need it. And that's still us trying to put ourselves right back in control. And so it really comes down to Psalm 62, 5 through 8. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him when things are good. Trust in him when everything seems right. No. Trust in him at all times. Oh, people, pour out your heart before him. I feel like a lot of times we're afraid to tell God how we're feeling as if he doesn't know. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah means pause, think about it. Is that us? Is that you? Have you gotten to that place? Or have you been fighting so hard for control? You just don't want to let go. And so you're restless and your mind isn't at ease, and you have no peace. And so when we are searching for peace, we pray, we trust, we remember the past, the things he's done. We treat the highs and the lows the same. Because when things are good, you didn't get yourself there. And when things are bad, you're not alone there. Right? When things are good, you didn't get yourself there. And when things are bad, you're not alone there. We trust his word. And we recognize it might not always be the obvious answer. And you'll be surprised how much peace you find when you get to the place where you are able to stop fighting for that control and you give it over to him. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the way you work. We thank you for such a crazy change uh, between Peter and how he handles his situation and Herod. Herod is in control of all of this and he has no peace and Peter has no control at all. And yet he finds himself completely at rest because he gives himself and he, his trust over to you. God, I pray that we are people that are able to trust in you. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand with us as we sing our closing song?